are tuning in to Teaching Trailblazers with Chris from Education to the Core. In this episode, we will be chatting with Tommy Bryant about STEM in the digital world. Tommy is a third to fifth grade STEM teacher from Northeastern Pennsylvania, and he is doing an amazing job incorporating his lessons from a brick and mortar classroom into the digital platform. If this is your first time hearing about Education to the Core, you landed in the right spot. At ETTC, we want to make sure you not only have the best resources created by master teachers, but we want to be there every step of the way guiding you in your classrooms so you can not only be there for your students, but you can have a better work-life balance. Make sure to subscribe to the ETTC YouTube channel, like this video, and visit educationofthecore.com for tons of teaching tips, resources, and freebies, which are updated daily. Below this video, you will find the links for all that ETTC has to offer, as well as any links we may be discussing during this vlog. Hello, Teaching Trailblazers. This is Chris from ETTC, and I am here with Tommy Bryan from Northeastern Pennsylvania. Hello, Tommy. How are you doing? I'm good, Chris. How are you? I'm doing well, thanks. Thanks for joining me today. I'm super excited to have you with us. Yeah, I'm excited to be here too. It's nice to have a uh, nice to have a platform to, you know, talk about what we do. Exactly. So really, Tommy, today, like I really want to focus on not only just STEM in general, but STEM in the digital world. And kind of my reasoning for thinking about this is not only do I just hear about all the great things you do as a STEM teacher, even last, like the past couple of years in the brick and mortar environment, I hear such good things about you, but more lately so that I am hearing how of an, much of an amazing job you're doing, taking what you've been doing and transitioning that into a digital platform. So I was super excited when you said yes, because I really wanted to invite you here, pick your brain, because so many of us and teachers across the country, especially are now facing either like a hybrid version of going back and forth, or I think everybody has some type of digital platform that they're using. Right. So before we jump into the STEM conversation, I would love to hear a little bit more about you as a teacher and kind of your pathway and what led you up to STEM. Sure, um, well, I started, I started um, my career out in, teaching graphic design. So I, you know, I, I went to college to be a technology education teacher. That's like my, my cert that I'm currently teaching under. And um, that include, that included a, a lot of different things. It's very broad. Um, I can teach graphic design, photography, woodworking, you name it. I mean, it's everything that kind of falls under that label. So I ended up in graphic design. Mm -hmm. uh, I ended up teaching at a different school, um, a lot of woodworking classes. Um, so I did I did woodworking for about seven years, and then um, I ended up at Valley View, which is where I'm teaching now, and that's the uh, that's where I got the label like STEM teacher, or sometimes the kids call me like Mr. STEM, because my class is specifically focused on engineering and you know STEM curriculum. Um, but I guess the way that I got there was basically just, I mean, everything that I've ever done was revolved around the design process, like teaching kids how to use the engineering design process to solve problems, whether I was teaching graphic design or woodworking. Um, and then when eventually the, uh, I saw the job opening for the STEM teacher at Valley View, uh, kind of made sense to me. Well, you know, this is basically where my, path has been going anyway and uh, I wanted an opportunity to, to teach younger students so it was really cool to kind of throw myself into okay I'm going to be an elementary school teacher now so before that I wasn't I was teaching uh, middle school and mostly high school so that's kind of how I ended up in the position I'm in now and that's been fun it was a uh, it's it was honestly it felt like a natural progression there wasn't many twists and turns and I wish I could say like, oh, I never saw myself in this position, but I kind of did. <laughs> Design piece is like so interesting to have kind of that background knowledge in to share with your students as well. Yeah. Yeah. It's not, and just having that little extra um, technology 
background mm -hmm. has been helpful. Exactly. So pretty much like kind of just for our viewers, when we talk about STEM, obviously like it's a kind of, when I think of it, it's like a mix of like just the whole, like what it stands for pretty much like science, the technology piece, engineering, mathematics. Now it's so great that you kind of have that background coming into this, but I'm kind of curious, like what would you say to teachers kind of like me, like I am very, very intimidated by math. Like I hear math, I like clam up and like, I even, I'm very vocal about it with my students. Like math freaks me out yeah. <laughs> and it makes me so nervous. So if I don't have that degree, like what would you kind of say to the typical? I, I, I'm not doing anything that a regular teacher that doesn't have like that type of background couldn't do. Um, like you were saying before, I, I know I, I do get um, a bit of recognition from the students because my class is fun because it's different. And I, ha I have a lot of freedom. I have the ability to kind of wow them with, you know, fancy, if we're, you know, if we're learning a certain concept, I like to have a, a fun experiment or maybe even involve some sort of toy or something with it. But um, it's more just applying anything that we learn to a real world situation. And that's basically what I view STEM as. I mean, the, the acronym STEM has been around for a long time and it's really nothing new I mean the only thing new about it is it's it's be becoming more recognized and being pushed into uh, you know education curriculum as a whole but, but yeah for the most part it's just learning something and applying what you learn to some sort of hands-on situation so yeah I don't think there's it's really nothing to be intimidated by especially like if you were to actually watch what I'm teaching, it's nothing different than what a regular edu education teacher might be doing. It's just sometimes I add a little bit more flair because I have the freedom to do that. I don't have all the, the restrictions of, you know, what you might have in your first grade class, you know. Sure. And just like for our viewers um, to be aware, so Tommy is, like he said, he's a STEM teacher elementary wise, but he's um, working with third, fourth and fifth grade students, yes. correct? That's right. Okay. And I do have to kind of bring up, you did say that they kind of get excited because of di different projects and the kind of toys that you kind of bring out and you kind of, you have an amazing space to work with and a lot of cool toys in there. <laughs> Um, that I'm sure you're really super excited about, like the 3D printer and those types yeah. of things too. Yeah. Um, I kind of have to ask. So let's think about at first a, a brick and mortar environment. What would you say would be your like top two favorite projects that you do with the kids? Okay. So it's really tough to actually pick one because I'm constantly changing little things here and there and they they kind of develop into my favorite and then a new one pops up. But, uh, all right, I have this, I have a lesson where I teach about um, transfers of energy in collisions. And it sounds fancy, but it's really just, um, it's a fourth grade lesson where I'm teaching the kids uh, different vocabulary that deals with energy, uh, potential and kinetic energy and things like that. And I, I try to, I try to line it up when, with when they're learning about potential and kinetic energy in their science class. And I teach them how energy transfers from one object to another. And to do that, we just crash a bunch of things. Like, so it's, it's one of my favorite lessons because I get to kind of just perform all of these funny little experiments in front of the class. And, you know, we, they, the kids end up building um, a vehicle that they have to protect an egg in the event of a crash. So there's a ton of design involved in it. Uh, there's a lot of collaboration, they work in teams. And it's probably my favorite because of the excitement around it. The kids get so excited about it and that's why it's fun for me. You know, it's, it's um, kind of talking about these complex physics situations, like the things that, things that you shouldn't be all that interesting, but the kids just, love the fact that we get to break things so it's <laughs> that's definitely my favorite i would say my second favorite is um teaching them how to design three-dimensionally on the computer 
um, for things that can be 3D printed. Uh, that's probably my second favorite because the kids, again, it's something that they get really excited about and it's something they could, they could design things and then see it printed in real life in front of them. So I would say those are my two favorite. Um, there's so many other things I, I can't really think of at the moment. <laughs> that's, that's great. Um, and especially that crash thing, that, I think I would be into that too. Like just, oh, just yeah. to break things. I mean, <laughs> yeah, set up, out. set up like a Lego wall and then we test to see what, what things can break through it, what won't. That's fun. It seems it. So in a situation like that, um, like let's just talk about like the energy piece and sure. um, because a lot of, I'm sure a lot of your projects and lessons kind of revolve in the same typical fashion where there's some type of like planning and like kind of to brainstorm and design the project or design what's going to happen. And then yeah. I'm assuming, and correct, please correct me if I'm wrong, it's like then kind of the experiment piece of actually conducting it and then a conversation after the fact of, okay, well, how do we make it better? What would happen kind of, am I, am, am I, am I kind of on the right track? That's, that's it. That's it. You nailed it. You'd, per, per you, perfect. STEM teacher. Yeah. You got it. <laughs> that's all it is. <laughs> Who would have thunk? I, I seem to be know what I'm talking about here now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, would you say kind of, what, what would you think would be the one of like the most important pieces, like the first step, last step, and kind of why is it one more important than the other? Oh, that I've never I've never actually asked myself like is one more important than the other. Um, it's hard to say that I I look at it kind of as a as one whole unit. Whenever we're going over things, it's you know obviously the the instruction aspect is is important. We need to we need to lay the groundwork with the students, give them some background knowledge. Um, I would say the most important part is kind of the, the brainstorming. I would say that's probably the most important, having the students kind of um, work through their, their own thoughts and ideas to come up with a solution to a problem. Um, I would say that's, that's probably what we spend the most time on. So, I mean, an example might be like they have to, that project I was talking about, they have to design a vehicle to protect an egg in the event of a crash. Um, I typically start with, let's brainstorm ideas for that specific situation. What do you got? You know, they, they sketch them out. We, we, I do group brainstorming. We, I might be drawing them on the board. Um, and then I give them the information. Here's, okay, so here's what, uh, here's what happens in the event of a crash. Here's the difference between potential and kinetic energy. Uh, you know, we go through a lot of different lessons. Here's, here's why seatbelts are in cars, things like that. Then the students, after getting that knowledge, can apply it to just kind of starting that process over again. All right, well, now let's brainstorm again. What, what kind of ideas do you have? Sketch them out, talk to, talk to the people in your team. I like to do a lot of teamwork and collaboration. So um, yeah, I would say just the, the whole the creative part of it, to me, is the most important letting the students kind of take what they learned and apply it to an idea. Awesome. So I was just, I was curious, like I said, like I am sure each step has its own pros and cons and yeah. obviously reasons behind it, but I was yeah. in like your and, thoughts, I was curious of what. <laughs> you and then obviously the, the last step would be the improvement. So, you know, after we test what went wrong, you know, hopefully something went wrong and there's room for improvement as there always is. And then we, you know, go back to the same process. How can you improve it? And, and then it just kind of keeps going full circle like that. So I would, I definitely say the brainstorming is the most important if I had to pick one. <laughs> <laughs> well, great. Thank you. And kind of like speaking of brainstorming, I actually had this saved a little bit later, but um, I totally would just want to bring it up now is another thing that I am obsessed that you do. Um, and it's kind of like the brainstorming and working together in groups and like the social aspect of things is um, in the brick and mortar environment, you ran an after school extracurricular activity um, and you ran a chess club. Yeah. For yeah. now, was that for the entire intermediate third, fourth, fifth grade, or did you focus purely on one grade? Um, the first year I opened it up to fourth and fifth grade. Um, 
and I had I had to turn so many kids away that you wouldn't think that there'd be this much excitement around a chess club, but I had like over 60 applicants for the club and I could only take 30. So I had to turn kids away and um, I gave priority to the fifth grade students. So then the next year um, I just kept it to fifth grade because I knew I would get the 30 students just from that. So yeah, this is right now it's just for my fifth grade students. And I actually teach them in fourth grade how to play chess. I actually wrap that into my curriculum as um, a way to teach learning coordinates. Um, we talk about strategy, planning ahead, I try to relate it to you know, all of our problem solving processes. Like, you know, this is your, we have to identify a problem. Okay, this is our goal. Let's brainstorm ideas. And we kind of take that and apply it to the game of chess. So it's, once I teach them the game, then they're, they become excited about it. So yeah, I get a, I get a lot of, a lot of kids interested in that after school club and I set it up so they can play against each other. They, I have them rotate through matches. They play everybody in the club. And sometimes we even have little tournaments and things like that. So that's fun. That's, it sounds like fun. And like, I never really thought of it as kind of like a teaching tool of like the coordinates and everything. That's really fascinating. I mean, not that I know how to play chess, or should I say know how to play it well? I, I had an ex that tried to teach me how to play chess once and um, how you say to identify a problem, that was my identified problem. <laughs> yeah, is I don't, that they I were don't trying try to, to teach me how to play chess mm -hmm. and um, it just did not end well because they thought the good idea would teach me the basics and then just kick my butt every single game Right. Yeah. to teach me what I'm doing wrong. I'm like, no, that's not teaching me. So yeah. I identified the big problem there. Yeah. Um, I'd love to say just real quick, if, if anyone out there was interested in starting their own chess club, like, you don't have to be good at chess to have run a fifth grade chess club. I mean, I'm not, I'm no chess master. You know, I just had an interest in the game and then realized I, I know I could use this in my curriculum and then saw the buzz and the excitement around the game. And that's where the club came from. But I, I'm not some sort of chess genius or anything like that. I just, I just like to play the game. <laughs> still hope for us all right sure but it's still it's just so cool and it's just so something that like you said the kids get so excited about it and again it's just taking that interest and they see the interest you have in the game and i'm sure they're looking up to you as kind of inspiration and kind of that mentor as well so they see you're excited and then they get excited about it too so yeah yeah it's funny to when all of a sudden you have kids excited about like Ooh, what move is he going to make? You know, especially when we put games up on the projector or something. If I, yeah, it's funny to see kids get excited about, you know, somebody moving a knight on a board <laughs> and you hear the room go. Oh. Pretty much now, I would kind of love to take even like what we talked about or even like something similar and kind of mesh it into the digital aspect of what you and I and so many other teachers are dealing with right now. Um, and like I said before, like I heard that you're just doing such an amazing job of finding like free resources out there and kind of just pairing what you did in the classroom um, virtually. So I would love to kind of just start off with the very basic. So at least at, in our district, families came, they picked up materials or, you know, so in some cases were dropped off at their homes. What type of materials did you provide your families for the at-home learning first quarter type? Yeah, of yeah, sure. So um, all I did, I made um, a little bag, a little sandwich size bag for each student, um, which, which was a lot of work. Uh, me and my wife did that actually. It was that, the preparation of that was, it took some time but it was definitely worth it because I was able to send home just a few little supplies to every student. And it included um, a little, a little hunk of modeling clay, uh, this like plastilina clay that it doesn't dry out. So they could, they don't, it's not like Play-Doh where if they leave it out, it turns rock hard. Um, so they had a little modeling clay. They had popsicle sticks, toothpicks, uh, rubber bands, pipe cleaners, um, that's, that's about it. I think that was it. So, and the only thing that I, I wanted to make sure that they had something to build with because we're, we're always doing something hands-on. Uh, 
so at home I could I could say like you know get your Legos or something like that but it, we don't know who has Legos who doesn't or so I wanted to I wanted to make sure that I can keep it consistent and everybody could have this hunk of clay and these couple little things to build with and uh, and I did I've had projects in the past where even in school these are the materials that we're building with so it's been working out pretty well. Uh, I, I would I would say an example would be um, for my third grade we learn about simple machines. Uh, after after learning about simple machines, the kids create their own simple machine at home. So they use the little pieces, little the clay and the popsicle sticks, and they have to create a lever, right? And then they show me the lever, and it's it's fun. They love it. They they love getting the chance to actually use that little bag with just clay and toothpicks and stuff in it. So yeah, that that's that's been pretty useful. I would say the clay is, I mean, it's so versatile, you can do anything with it. Um, so that's been pretty helpful. And then paper and pencil. I mean, I could, I could do everything just with that, really. We don't need the clay and all that. We, if, as long as they have something to write with and something to write on, we can complete every project. I mean, most of it is just from your mind to the paper. So yeah, it's been going good with that. Well, that's good. And yeah. it kind of just seems that you didn't really have to adapt a lot of your expectations to the digital platform. It kind of seems to me that a lot of kind of what you were doing in face-to-face -face kind of still apply of what you're expecting from them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I would say the only, the expectations that I had to adjust were time. Um, I have less time because of different things, you know, whether it's technological issues or we're waiting for kids to log on whenever you're transitioning between anything, especially digitally, it's, it takes time. Um, so I had to, I had to adjust some expectations with that, but uh, yeah, it's been going well. The kids still enjoy the class. They still seem excited, especially when, you know, I bring up a new project or anything new that we're going to be learning about. They, they still, I still feel that same energy, you know? So if, if I have that going, I, I, I think it's working. Great, great. So you kind of speak about like the tech issues and I do have to say not only just in STEM, like that's something I even found myself as a teacher of just everything is taking way more time yeah. than what you think. And it's not because of like what you're doing, what the kids are doing. It's just so many of the unknowns type of thing. And um, overall, especially something with like the engineering and like the kind of the brainstorming and practice piece of things. Um, are you finding that the students are navigating well and like still like that aspect of things? Yeah, I mean, we've been virtual for a long time now, basically since April of last year. <laughs> um, feels like longer actually. But um, at this point, I would say that the students are doing really well. I better than I would ever expect. Um, there, yeah, any technological issues that we run into at this point isn't going to upend any lesson. It's not changing much because they've been through it. We've all been through, oh, technological issue. It just requires some patience and some problem solving and we figure it out. So um, yeah, I, they're doing amazing with it. I would say that any there's a lot of, you know, obviously there's a lot of downfalls to the situation that we're in teaching just specific, just digitally, but there's so many positives. I mean, I can only imagine the trajectory that these kids are now on technologically, which is important. I mean, we're in a digital world, like the skills that they're gaining just by doing this is something they would have never been able to, to have, especially at this age. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's problems, but we, like I said, it's, it's just another, another problem to solve. So try to approach it the same way we do with all our projects, you know, <laughs> let's yeah, use the, yeah, the yeah, it's, a process. it's a learning experience. And you, like yeah. I said, you take every problem. It's like, okay, like let's brainstorm. How do we solve this and yeah. um, figure it out together? So exactly. That's, that's such a great point. And I really like the aspect that you're saying is, kind of taking this somewhat like negative change 
in all of our lives and you're really focusing on a positive and it, it shows. Um, so overall, I would love to kind of just now pick your brain a little bit about like resources that you're finding. Um, I know you spoke very briefly, I think even like to me, like on the side, like a while ago about this, like online, free online system that you found. And um, I would just love just to hear like kind of what resources you're picking from, like what kind of thing you're doing now in a virtual platform. Sure. Yeah. Um, I use, I've been using a lot of resources from colleges. So if, if you're looking for like reliable content, especially re re revolved around STEM, there's a lot of um, universities that have been putting a lot of, like every day there's something new. Um, the, the University of Colorado has these physics simulators. It's called PHET, uh, physics, education technology. And they're these little, like, they're kind of like video games that the kids can play and they're completely web-based. Um, you don't need like any kind of Adobe extension or anything like that to use them. You just open them up. It's a link in the chat in our Google meet, you know, um, the kids click on it. And then all of a sudden they're, they're in this little virtual game and it's a simulator where they can click things and move them around the screen. And it, it's so useful if we're teaching, um, if I'm teaching about things like transfers of energy, there's one that, that shows collisions with a pendulum. Um, there's one that shows a little, there's a skate park where you have this little um, skater girl and you could build this little skate park and it shows you know her transfer from potential energy to kinetic energy and it shows her transfers of speeds. And it's just, it's so much fun for the kids and it just, it makes, you know, being kind of physically disconnected oblivious at that point they don't even care they're they're having fun and they're they're learning about this you know complex co concept but they're they're enjoying it so that that's a that's a useful tool i use um tinkercad it's an autodesk program um and that's what i use for uh, 3d printing so whenever they're designing things in, in brick and mortar um this is that same program that i use to 3d print their projects but it's a wonderful way for them to actually design and build things digitally. Um, it's completely free. They just need an account. Um, I'm, I'm the moderator of all of their accounts. So it's completely safe. Um, and they can actually build things three-dimensionally on the screen. Um, so whatever they have in their mind or if they sketched out an idea in their notebook, they can transfer that to something that looks physical. It's the closest to hands-on that we can get without actually being hands-on. So it's been really useful. Um, it's, it's very useful for teaching measurement. Uh, it, there's, a, there's so many things that you can use that program for, and I would recommend it to anybody. It's an Autodesk program called Tinkercad. It's just tinkercad.com. Great. Well, definitely. I'll link that in with our blog and the information below too to, for people to check out. That's really and I'm sure there's people that are going to say like, oh, great, another username and password. Like this is, I can't deal with this anymore, right? I mean, it, it's, but um, they have made it easier. It's like so many companies are adapting to the situation that we're in. Um, so like our students have, all have a Google account. It's their Valley View email account. So they could actually just use their Google account to log in, which is extremely helpful. It simplifies the whole process. That's really good. Mm -hmm. um, so it kind of seems like you're really finding a lot of resources that are very like interest-based for the age group that you have like it's very age appropriate very you know interesting to them that you know they it naturally would make them want to kind of participate and um do everything uh, of course i always always have to throw in some type of little classroom management question um some always has to be a little tiny behavioral question thrown in there so have you experienced, because again, a lot of these things are, like I said, very interest-based. Um, if students are refusing or like any experience of any type of behavior during your lessons, like what are your go-to classroom management tips and tricks? Sure. Um, God, like, so this is something that I'm kind of, I am kind of struggling with and I'm just kind of, you know, this is new. So like the first time I, I encountered a classroom management problem live 
in our you know digital lesson i kind of froze out oh, what do i do now <laughs> i don't know like i have i feel like i have no control over the situation you know but uh you know lately it's it's just been um kind of approaching first of all it's absolute positive encouragement for participation because i don't really have any behavior issues at the moment but um, participation is something that comes into uh, everything that we're doing if, if the kids aren't participating it makes it extremely difficult so um with when the kids are participating i try to just kind of shower them with praise now i there's a lot of things that um that can be done like i know our regular education teachers are using uh, the pbis program which is something i'm a part of in the in the intermediate school um and a lot of them are giving out uh, reward points and things like that that the kids can then kind of cash in with later they could purchase little uh moments to themselves or, or um, there's a lot of different prizes that they can buy um, with their with their kind of good behavior points but for me it is it has just been keeping it interesting keeping them engaged um, and just just keeping the class moving because if the kids are bored that's when i run into problems so <laughs> it's just for the most part my this is how i've been surviving um my classroom management for this what the situation we're in has just been let's let's keep it as engaging as possible you know yeah. and that, yeah. that that's been working no and the points and you bring up i mean praise is so powerful to begin with anyway yeah so that's always like the number one thing that we always say and um if it's any consolation like i mean my whole entire background is behavior and behavior management i myself am struggling so much in the digital world because again you know they're not in front of you you're not like let's take a break you're not eyes watching and it's one of those things that if a student does get annoyed or frustrated they close their computer they walk away and you're like again you get that like deer in the light I, it's the same thing tommy like i froze and i'm like what do i do i'm like come back <laughs> no, no, this isn't supposed to happen. Like, yeah. and it's like you said, it's just really kind of taking the spin of, you know, just keep going, making it engaging and really focusing on the positives. Cause again, it's, we're limited a little bit more now than behaviorally managing wise. So, I mean, I'm with you on that one. You're, we're, you're doing the right thing, keeping with the praise and keeping with everything. So So now that we're kind of talking a little bit more about like the behavioral piece and how things are a little bit changing for all of us, um, I also, besides a behavior question, kind of like to toss in in regards to self-care. And you kind of said things are really different. And, you know, I naturally just from our conversation, you're a very positive person and you always kind of take that positive spin on things, which is so refreshing. But what are, how are you kind of coping with the whole... I guess world as it is right now. And like, what's, what's your go-to self-care for yourself? So yeah, that's, that's actually another thing that's been sort of difficult because I, I do focus on that. And, you know, a few months ago it was exercise, stay active, stay positive. Um, I would say that my number one thing right now, especially relating to like our job, is to continue to try to immerse myself like in my subject area in the job as much as possible um, which sounds like of course that's what you should do at your job right but um in the past it wasn't always a priority of mine to immerse myself in into it and to really just buy into you know what I'm doing. And uh, I think that helps a lot because it helps, like you said, it helps me stay positive. It helps me stay excited about what I'm doing. And it helps kind of reflect on the students. Uh, like you were saying before, if I'm excited, they get excited and it's kind of a give and go from there. So um, I would say immersing myself in what I'm doing and kind of getting excited about every single lesson. How can I get excited about this? Is it going to be, am I going to play upbeat music as the kids log in so that we're okay, here we go, you know, playing some Pharrell or Justin Timberlake or something like that would get the kids moving, right? Um, so that's that's been helpful 
just to keep a positive disposition throughout the day. And then um, transitions, like I'm, I'm teaching from home. So I, when it's, my day is done teaching, it, you know, it, it never feels like it is over because you still have, you still get emails and um, I prioritize those more now than ever where if I get an email at six o'clock at night from a parent or a student, um, there's, you know, a year ago, I probably would have said, I'm like, oh, well, this is, I'll answer that at eight o'clock tomorrow. But now I, 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 there's this pressure like, oh no, they're, you know, they need help or there's, you know, everybody's in this together. So we need to, so I do end up answering those emails. And so it's, it's hard to kind of turn it off, but I do transition with a game of chess. So, you know, I like to play chess. So it's kind of like just helping me focus on one thing that is not teaching. So the day is over. I play a game of chess. I focus on that. I don't focus on anything else. I'm not talking to my Amazon device or anything else. I'm just focused on that. And that helps me kind of say, okay, now I can accomplish other things. So that's, that's kind of where I'm at with self-care. I don't know if it's the right thing, but it's been helping. <laughs> it's a thing. And I think that's, that's exactly. what the big takeaway is that it's, as long as we find just one thing to get our mind off of just work and just be human. And cause like you said, it, it's really hard to turn it off in a digital world. Like it's hard to not be constantly attached to the computer, our email, our lessons. Yeah. And it's finding kind of what makes us happy and um, keep doing that and doing you. So yeah. that's exciting. So thank you. Um, I would, anything, any last words of wisdom, resources, tricks you have up your sleeves that you'd like to share with us before we kind of say our goodbyes? Um, I, I, you know what? I would just say that I, I use a lot of, like, like you were saying, kind of fancy toys. Uh, it can be, it could be a flashy class and that's why I do get a lot of the kids get excited about it. And, um, but I'm, what I do is really nothing all that special that a, anyone anyone could do what I do. It's just, um, so if you wanted to incorporate some sort of STEM lesson into your classroom, you're probably, first of all, you're probably already doing it. Um, there's, you know, it's, it's just become a buzzword and um, people don't realize that they are teaching STEM. But um, I would say if you are thinking, am I teaching STEM? It would be teaching a lesson. You're teaching measurement in math class. Um, are the students taking that information and then applying it to something else? So um, kind of a, a generic example would be like, you know, you teach measurement and then the students measure things with a ruler or a tape measure. Um, and you could take that a step further and incorporate some design, which is where I think that the STEM comes in, um, where then the students are given a certain criteria and constraints. So they have to design something that's one inch by two and a half inches. And that's the criteria and constraints and they have to um, follow that throughout the process. So I, I, it's not as um, intimidating, you know, when you break it down that way. And I don't know, I hope that was helpful. I hope I didn't bore you with any- <laughs> No, I was, I was very in tuned and um, it was really interesting to me too, because again, like you just brought it up at the very end here of, not only do you have to have that specialty in STEM to kind of understand it and apply it, but it's kind of just, you can do it with any lesson and any type of materials. Cause again, you send home very limited everyday type of materials for these kids to use. Um, but it's just any teacher can, you know, incorporate it with a story that they're, they're reading or just a couple of weeks ago, we had a, kind of an adaptation of the three little pigs story. So of course we just had a brainstorm, just talking it out, not really having a full design build rebuild type of aspect to it, but it was just like, okay, well, what could the first pig do to make his house stronger type of thing? Yeah. So it's just the dialogue of that nature of the brainstorming and planning aspect of it is what I'm really enjoying. And three little pigs, that could be, a, that could be a really good stem lesson i like this idea that you just gave me Ooh, there we go okay <laughs> I, think I, have, I think i have my next lesson boom 
<laughs> but yeah, but like, and you said, like you were just talking, it's just the brainstorming, the planning, the building, and then kind of just the regrouping and seeing how to make things better. Yeah. As we just naturally do, especially in our profession, it's, we kind of brainstorm, plan, and then we reflect of, and yeah. problem solve how to make things better. So. Yeah, that's it. That's STEM. <laughs> Perfect. Solving all the world's problems. Look at that. Yeah. <laughs> But thank you so, so much, Tommy. I uh, really appreciate your time and your information on STEM in the digital world. I know I got tons out of this and I cannot wait to, I, now I don't feel as intimidated with some of the engineering aspects of and math of STEM that I came into this dialogue with. So thank you for putting me at ease. Um, and I can't wait to try some of these things in my classroom too. So thank you so much. And I would love to have you back another time too and pick your brain some more. Thank you, Teaching Trailblazers of Education to the Core, for joining Tommy Bryan and me, Chris, for STEM in the Digital World. Make sure to like and share this video, as well as subscribe to this YouTube channel. We will be meeting with more teachers across all disciplines for support, strategies, and engaging activities that you can implement in your own classrooms. We would also love to hear from you in the comments down below. This channel and Education to the Core is all about helping you grow in your profession and build this community together. Remember, be kind and be strong. I hope to see you again real soon. Thanks. Bye.